into the University in St. Louis, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there today due to some health issues. Today I'm going to talk about one of my recent projects on how prenatal environment might be associated with the pace of cortical network development during the first three years of life. Seminal studies in animal models have shown that the environment, whether it is impoverished with scarce resources or enriched with novelty and complexity, affects brain size, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, and more. But rats and mice don't develop the elaborate language and complex cognition that humans do. So to understand the neural mechanisms by which the environment might be associated with the development of these abilities, these abilities, we need to study brains and specifically human brains in the context of their surrounding environment. One aspect of the environment that fundamentally shapes day-to-day -day experiences for children and has been associated with language and the brain is socioeconomic status, or SES for short. SES is a broad and multidimensional construct, construct usually comprising variation of parental education, uh, income, and neighborhood advantage, among other domains. But the reason we care about this broad and fuzzy construct is that it's associated with all kinds of later life outcomes, including health, wealth, and mental well-being. Various theoretical models have argued that growing up in a higher or lower SES environment might, ex might accelerate or decelerate brain, but empirical data has been sparse. So this open question still remains. Do experiences associated with SES affect the pace of brain development? To answer this question, I've had the good fortune to work with the eLab study here at WashU, a longitudinal study of neonates and toddlers. As part of this large interdisciplinary study, mothers were recruited during the first trimester of pregnancy, oversampling for moms from low-income backgrounds, and we've continued to follow the development of their children as they grow up. Prenatal SES was assessed during all three trimesters using several health, demographic, and survey measures of social disadvantage. And as you can see from the histogram here of income to needs ratio, we had quite a range of socioeconomic diversity with many folks at or near the poverty line here and a total of 318 moms with full-term units at birth. Importantly, we also collected neuroimaging data from these children with resting state and structural MRI collected at birth, then again at two years, and then again at three years. We use the Bailey scales of infant development to assess language at one, two, and three years of age. So using this sample in a pre-registered set, pre set of analyses, language and trajectories of cortical network development in neonates and toddlers using functional MRI. Specifically, we used functional MRI or fMRI to take a network approach to studying brain development where we examined correlations in spontaneous brain activity in regions across the cortex, and we, rep and we represented these patterns as a network, as shown in this network schematic here in the lower right, where pairs of brain regions whose activity fluctuates in tandem, like these two in green here, are inferred to be strongly functionally connected, and pairs of brain regions that do not, for example, like this red one over here, uh, have weak or no connections between them. So you can see some you can see some nodes or brain regions here. You'll notice in this uh, schematic in the lower right that some of these brain regions or uh, the circles on um, the cortex here have more densely clustered connectivity with each other and sparse connectivity between them as represented by the blue uh, circles outlining these uh, groups. This characteristic is known as network segregation, or just segregation for short, and is an established concept in network neuroscience. It's generally found to be important for cognition as it reflects increasing specialization of sets of cortical regions for their specific purposes. So here I'm showing you a schematic example of a network with relatively high levels of segregation, but a network with lower levels of segregation or clustering of connectivity, but with the same number of regions and connections might look something like this. We wanted to study specifically the development of network segregation across the cortex in our longitudinal data set and how the environment might be associated with that trajectory. 
So first we looked at how cortical network segregation changed with age. So here I'm showing you age on the x-axis here and network segregation on the y-axis with data points from one child over time, connected by time, connected by lines. And see that network segregation is increasing with age during the first three years of life and most strongly so during the first two years um, as represented by the shaded portion of the line here. But what we're really interested in is whether and how SES might affect this trajectory. So here I'm showing you a very similar plot with age again on the x-axis, on the x-axis, and cortical network axis, um, with neonates and toddlers from lower SES backgrounds shown in blue, um, and neonates and toddlers from higher SES backgrounds shown in orange. When we examined whether SES was associated with these developmental increases, we found that neonates and toddlers from lower SES backgrounds show a steeper increase in measures of functional network segregation with age, with age than neonates and toddler SES backgrounds, potentially consistent with faster or accelerated development in the few years after birth. Back in 2021, we tried to trace out from studies existing then possible trajectories of how the pace of brain network segregation might be associated, uh, might be affected or associated with SES, um, with the studies that existed back then. So this is the same kind of plot with age on the x-axis and network segregation on the y-axis. And here, these lines below represent studies, um, where each line is a study, and the length of the line uh, represents the age range that was examined in that study. We can try and trace out how SES might affect the pace of development of network segregation based on the few studies that have examined this in older children, and add in the work that I just showed you in the eLab sample here in uh, neonates and toddlers early in life. And I've made the lines dotted here where we don't have much evidence, but we might come up with a model that looks something like this, where toddlers from higher SES backgrounds, shown in orange here, show more widespread connectivity and thus lower segregation earlier in development before the rapid development of a more segregated network architecture that continues into adolescence and adulthood. Lower levels of segregation in toddlers from higher SES backgrounds early on might reflect a more prolonged developmental period for synaptic proliferation or later closures of plasticity in neonates and toddlers from higher SES backgrounds, which allows for more functional range to prune and wire optimally segregated networks later on here in adolescence. We wanted to ask, what might be the cognitive consequences of SES-associated differences in network segregation? So here I'm showing you again age on the x-axis, um, with here the y-axis being uh, scores on the Bailey language uh, composite, where 100 here would be exactly typical for age. Um, and you can see, you can see that language scores by SES around two years of age. This has been shown many times, um, but what we wanted to ask is whether differences in segregation that we start to see around two years might be associated with these differences in language. And indeed, we find that at two, higher levels of segregation are associated with worse, perform worse performance on the Bailey language scale after correcting across tests. So the directionality of this is such that higher levels of segregation found in toddlers from lower SES backgrounds are associated with worse language scores, while lower levels are associated with better language scores. And this was true even after controlling for the effect of prenatal SES on language at year two, suggesting that cortical network segregation might be independently associated with language abilities. This was true for both receptive and expressive language scales, so this was not more driven by one than the other. And these patterns of associations were also broadly true at year three, but due to COVID, we didn't have as large a sample size at that time. But if you're interested, I'd encourage you to check that out in the preprint. So what did I show you here today? Uh, well, we saw that cortical network development during the first three years of life is associated with prenatal SES, suggesting environmental influences may shape this trajectory. Developmental increases in network segregation are accelerated in neonates and toddlers from disadvantaged backgrounds. And importantly, SES-associated differences in network segregation are associated with expressive and receptive language abilities at two years of age. 
And this was true even after controlling for the effect of prenatal SES on language abilities. This suggests that lower levels of cortical network segregation early on might set children up for an optimal pruning trajectory through later childhood and adolescence, where we see a kind of reversal in the directionality of associations between segregation and, and language over development, over development, where early on segregation are advantageous for language, but later on in adolescence and adulthood, higher levels of segregation might be advantageous. Overall, this really underscores the importance of understanding developmental trajectories when considering the brain over time and emphasizes the first years of life as a target for policies aimed at supporting optimal child, optimal child development. I'd like to thank my mentors and my team um, and encourage you to check out some of the papers linked in the QR codes if you're interested in this work. Um, and please do reach out to me via email or social media with any questions. You can also check out my poster uh, this afternoon in the poster area, um, which a colleague will be putting up. Thank you all for your time and attention.